Hello and good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you're at and whatever you're doing. Uh, we are grateful that you chose to spend some time with us, whether you worship with us on the live stream and then you wanted to check the sermon in a different format or you just happened to come across us. I am grateful that you chose to spend some time in worship with Mountain View. Now, we do have a few announcements that I'd like to make. First off, I want to remind you of your giving options, and there'll be a little slide here. Uh, we really do rely upon everyone's giving to enable ministries at this church, to uh, supporting staff and what we do, but also supporting our food pantry, among other things. Uh, so the other announcements I have, there's a leadership council meeting on uh, the 30th of October. So if you're getting this video that morning, then the 30th of October there is a leadership meeting right after church. Uh, so if you're on that team, please make sure you're there. Coming up November 12th is our church conference. So that's where we'll do a full assessment of what's going on at the, at the church and uh, kind of setting the tone for things that we're going to be focus on, focusing on in the coming year and how we're going to go about some of those things. Also coming up November 20th is our interfaith service. Now I haven't found out if we're going to record and or live stream that yet, but that will be at 1 o'clock November 20th, so it's in the afternoon, uh, followed by a time of fellowship with coffee, tea, pie, that type of thing. Uh, it should be a good time. It's a very interesting type of service to be involved in because we have different religious leaders from all sorts of different faiths. So it's, it's really interesting to be a part of. Also, if you are on the worship committee, worship team, um, we're going to have a meeting on November 7th, or I should say I would like to have a meeting with you on November 7th at Fire Creek Coffee, which is on the other side of town. So if you're on, in that group, please make sure you mark that on your calendar uh, for 11.30 in the morning, November 7th. And I hope to see you there. That's all the announcements I have. Um, again, thank you for, for joining us. Make sure you stay tuned to our Facebook page and newsletter because we put out all sorts of information of different things going on. I'd like to invite you to bow your heads in prayer with me. Righteous One, hear our cries in the bitter watches of the night. We come before you with zeal in our heart, ready to stand at our watch post, ready to receive the vision you promise your people. We come seeking justice for the weak, hope for the downtrodden, and healing for the afflicted. In times of trial, we yearn to see your face and behold the glory of our salvation. Be the vision we need that we may find the courage to persevere, that salvation may come to our homes this day through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1-4, through 4, and then 11-12. through 12. I'm reading the Common English Bible. As I said before, I just kind of changed to that right now. I don't know if I'll stay with it or not. Who knows? But I'm reading that version, and I encourage you, if you're following along, uh, you'll, I won't be reading the middle section we jump over, but I do encourage you to read that. It helps with some of the more different pieces of, the, uh, of understanding the passage. But anyway, listen for the voice of God. From Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God our Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, Grace and peace to all of you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we must always thank God for you. This is only right because your faithfulness is growing by leaps and bounds, and the love that all of you have for each other is increasing. That's why we ourselves are bragging about you in God's churches. We tell about your endurance and faithfulness and all the harassments and troubles that you have put up with. We are constantly praying for you for this, that our God will make you worthy of his calling and accomplish every good desire and faithful work by his power. Then the name of our Lord Jesus will be honored by you, and you will be honored by him, consistent with the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here ends the reading of God's word for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
I grew up in a small town, uh, a small town in some ways very similar to Cottonwood. Um, Cottonwood itself has been, uh, my understanding of its history anyway, has been a small town uh, until relatively recently when the wine industry and Main Street had kind of taken off. And uh, this whole community has since gotten bigger and bigger in part because of those things and, and retired people moving in, all those, all those sorts of things. Uh, my, my hometown was always on the smaller end, at least when I grew up, and, but it has also been growing. And one of the reasons for that is its close proximity to both Philadelphia and Baltimore back east. Uh, but when I was growing up, it was small. Not so small that we didn't have a light. We only had one light, I believe, at the time. Maybe two. I can't remember. I'm not one that gets very nostalgic for small towns uh, or that small town feel. Growing up in a town like that, uh, where everyone knew your name and, you know, everybody knew your family, it led to some special problems that I don't really wish upon my kids or anyone else. Um, for instance, I'm sure some of you could share stories similar to this, but if you broke the rules, if you did something against the rules, your parents would hear about it from your aunt who happened to live on the same street and you didn't know they saw you, you know, stuff like that. Um, a feeling of my hometown, uh, another uh, problem, I should say, in my hometown was the public school system. Now, I'm going to go on a little caveat here to try to help explain it, because uh, Katie and I grew up in the same town, but for lack of a better way to put it, Katie was of a different class than I was. No, I don't mean graduating class. We graduated from the same class, but um, a higher standard of class <laughs> than me. So even though we were at the same school and stuff and we have a lot of the same experiences, there are some experiences that I had that she didn't have. And it all relates to the fact that my family lived in that town for, you know, a hundred years already. My, you know, my family had a, a farm in the community since 1918. In fact, if I dig into family history, they, you know, they had farms in Virginia, but they would come up into that general area to find a wife. Don't ask me how, I don't know. But anyway, um, you know, the family did sell the farm a number of years ago. As my grandfather would have said, there was no money in milking cows anymore. Um, but by the time I was in school, my family already had a long history in the community. Uh, in fact, in high school, if you were in the lobby of what would now be the old high school, they've since built a new one, I could have pointed to the woodwork there in the lobby and said that my grandfather had helped build that uh, when he was in high school as part of shop class. So there, there's a lot of history there, but one of the problems I faced growing up in a small community like that is you were then defined by your family. If your uncles were problem kids in school, you were going to be a problem kid. Uh, I still remember my older brother asking my one uncle what they ever did to the principal, because if for whatever reason the principal that day recognized my didn't recognize my brother but called him by my uncle's name, he would cross to the other side of the hallway. So I don't I don't know what happened there, but uh, you know you begin to be known by the collective experience of your family. So the expectation in the school uh, was that I was supposed to be a farmer. Now, nobody ever came out directly and said that, but that was kind of the underlying pressure. Uh, your family is a family of farmers, and that's all you'll ever be. We're defined by those pressures in our lives. In some cases, the pressures mold us into whatever the pressures want us to be. In other times, we react or act differently because of those pressures so that we move away from that. So for instance, uh, I did at one point want to be a farmer, but at some point I decided I wanted to get a college education and become a pastor. So I directly countered those pressures. I didn't become that in spite of those pressures. So it can have an effect either way. The church in Thessalonica is no different. Uh, when this letter is written, it's written as an encouragement to this church. And the opening verses are always a little odd to talk about 
at first because what do we talk about in a greeting, right? There's no mention, um, well, okay. So there's a reason we skipped the chunk in the middle of everything that we read. Um, what we're doing is we're talking about the church in Thessalonica's identity and how do they identify as people of God. So the parts we have or read today are parts that talk about what the author knows about the church and what they've been saying about the church, their reputation. The, the part we skipped over are critical verses that help us understand what's going on. Um, those are verses that speak of Christ coming again and divine judgment uh, because the church is being persecuted. They're not particularly easy verses to preach on, uh, but I think they're important for understanding this church's, you know, the, Th the Thessalonica church, their identity. I'm not going to spend any more time on that, really, because I want to focus on the idea of how is the church known. According to this letter, this church is known for their love, their, their peace, that they, they strive to live out. And the author gives thanks for that peace and that faithfulness. And I would probably add love, because I really can't imagine any of those things exist without love. This is what this group's known for. This is what they're being encouraged about. And this is what they're being encouraged to maintain as they face mounting pressure from the community around them to conform themselves to their community's values. Now, I could easily take this message and talk about how we shouldn't conform to society's values. If you've been around me for very any length of time, you'll know that I talk about this type of thing, but usually not in that way. I feel like, more often than not, the church has already conformed to the culture around it, so w I have to try to remind us all that not to conform to the, what is standard in the church even, because that's not really holding up what's going on. I don't really want to go this route, though, with this message, because I want to ask you a question. What are you known as? Now, I don't mean you as an individual. I mean you as a church. See, this is my sixth year here at Mountain View, and it's taken me almost six years to get in the community enough to hear from people what Mountain View is known as. And I have to tell you, there's good and bad in this. I've heard people say that Mountain View is generous and approachable, that it will accept all types of people. But I've also heard it said that they're judgmental, they're very closed off, and they're full of cliques. And everything I listed is true, both the good and the bad. I don't say this to go, how dare Mountain View, how dare you as a people not be better, but to say that we have a choice in how we're going to be known. You know, I've been ecstatic over the last year when I've had a couple of teenagers tell me that they heard Mountain View is a very open congregation, that they'll accept anyone. But I've also been sad to hear when people who start attending feel like they can't get into any groups and that our groups are, are, are too... Um, too insular to allow other people to come in. Uh, our church community has to decide who and what we shall be. It, it's a choice. If we're going to be known by our good identity characteristics, then that needs to become the priority in everything we do, no matter where we're at. You can't just be generous with the food pantry. You have to be generous with our time and sit and get to know one another. Uh, we can't project the idea that anybody can attend and be a part of Mountain View, yet when people come, we don't include them and allow them to change things to be the way they want to be it. Well, I know, I know. Uh, so, Pastor, we invite people and these people come, but, you know, we need to have them do certain things in certain ways. And, and yeah, that's partly true, except... There's a lot of flexibility, or should be a lot of flexibility in that. If you don't allow people to take their own ownership of what they will or won't do, or can or can't do in a ministry, you're not really being open. You're not really being inviting. 
if you snap at people because they don't do things exactly the way you want them or you know I'm gonna pick on the decorating maybe things weren't decorated just so just the way that you like them then what you're really showing is while you want people to come and do it what you want people to do is come and take orders of what you want them to do so I guess what I'm saying is if we're going to be known by our good characteristics like the Thessalonica church we're going to have to wrestle with what we really mean by being those things if, if we're going to grow as a church if we're going to adapt and change to the situations that we are currently living in the reality is we need to open ourselves up much like the author of this letter I give thanks for all the great things in this church and all the great things that we continue to embody and do together not just in what we say we're going to do but what we actually do we're known we are known by good things and we need to continue to embody those good things now of course I'm going to follow this up with my normal you're going to mess this up the church is going to mess this up I'm going to mess this up we make mistakes you know sometimes we should be more gracious and and we snap because we're having a bad day I, I get it that's okay that's why there's grace and peace and love and hope and all those things it's to help us do better next time but the only way our church is going to grow and continue to grow is by being the people who we are called to be at this time in this place by being faithful to being open to all, to being accepting of all, to bringing people in and, and including people. We need to be true and faithful to that. And I call upon each and every one of us to do that. Stay happy, healthy, and safe this week. Amen.